Hello, good morning. It's Friday and this is Elevens is with Fran. So here's how it works. You get a cup of tea and a piece of cake, a biscuit maybe, and I read you a short story. Today's short story is called Year of Decision and it was written by Molly Pantadans in 1944 and I chose it for this morning because it feels strangely relevant and I'm sure you'll see why. All right, you ready? You got your cup of tea? That's very important. You need your cup of tea. Very important. Okay, ready? Good. Year of Decision by Molly Pantadans. Mark Goring sometimes reflected, without bitterness, but with rather wry amusement, how he had pictured a war back in the unbelievable days of peace and how his own particular war had turned out. The fact couldn't have been more ludicrously different from the fancy. In the first place, he'd always somehow imagined himself in the thick of things, living a life which would be quite sharply defined from his peacetime life, dangerous, difficult and exciting. Nothing of the sort had happened, of course. The fact that he was a specialist in a, in a particular subject had quickly settled him for the duration in a government office, behind an impressively large desk, which would doubtless be regarded with a good deal of envy by many other young Englishmen now slogging across Italy. War had differed from peace only in that one worked harder, smoked more, and was progressively more and more uncomfortable at home. But discomfort was hardly danger. Except for dodging a few bombs in the Blitz, his had been a remarkably safe war. It had taught him none of the stinging, salutary lessons that he'd expected. Instead, he'd picked up all sorts of curious, unlikely bits of inf information, such as how to make a bed, scour a greasy saucepan, and lay a breakfast table so that it did not too greatly resemble the haphazard design of the March Hare's tea party. It was often a toss-up in Mark's mind as to which was the better thing to do to help Janet, to stay up in London at the club all week or to go back at night to the desirable residence on a Buckinghamshire common which they still called home. He could never quite decide whether the charm of his company made up for the trouble he created <laughs> or whether Janet didn't really prefer to crawl gratefully after the sort of scratched up meal which women apparently enjoyed when they were alone, hmm, well, which women apparently enjoyed when they were alone into an early and solitary bed. On the nights he stayed in London, he had to admit guiltily that it was rather pleasant to dine in peace, off China that he wouldn't later have to swab awkwardly with a little mop and to read luxuriously in a bed which no one expected him to make next in the middle, that's exciting. Um, Lying there comfortably in a neat room in a club where there was still port in the cellars and help in the kitchen, he would feel bad about Janet struggling along at home with a biggish house and the dreadful inescapable fact that the human body needs stoking three times a day. Mm, yes. Of course, everybody was in the same boat. Servants hardly existed any longer and it was worse for the old people like his mother who hadn't a soul to help her in a great barn of a place in Dorset, and four hungry land girls coming in at all hours with their great pink mouths wide open for her to drop hot, satisfying food into. Yes, everybody was in the same boat all right, although it sometimes seemed to Mark that Janet and the rest of their class were making unnecessarily heavy weather of it by refusing to recognise that they were bang in the middle of a social revolution. Life continued in the same old pattern, distorted but recognisable. The Goring still dined off a polished table by candlelight, though Mark couldn't help feeling that the sensible thing to do would be to camp in the kitchen. And why not keep the same knife and fork right through dinner, as they made you do in small provincial French restaurants? It would save an astronomical amount of washing up yearly, Mark calculated. But the idea had affronted Janet, who preferred to weep tears of fatigue into the washing up water. <laughs> With the helpless obedience and neatness of the performing poodle going through its routine, although the rest of the troop had defaulted. <laughs> I'd forgotten how brilliantly funny this story is. With the helpless obedience and neatness of the performing poodle going through its routine, although the rest of the troop had defaulted, she turned down their bed and laid out her night things, his pyjamas, as they had found them every night of their peacetime married lives. Oh, for heaven's sake, why bother, Mark would say. It doesn't matter to me or Hitler whether I pick up my, my pyjamas off a chair or the floor. But Janet would answer obstinately, it matters to me though, and go on smoothing the eider down, setting her blue mules invitingly, as though the action were yet another moral shot 
fired at the slowly advancing enemy. As though by setting the mules in their accustomed place, she was nailing the brave, idealistic upper-class colours securely for another 24 hours. It was funny, but when he'd thought of war back in the good old days, before it happened, he supposed that he had vaguely pictured Janet seeing him off somewhere, crying down his collar, writing him her particular brand of funny, sweet letter, and waiting for him on an unidentified platform, looking lovely and desirable in a dress he liked. Well, it hadn't worked out that way. She had seen him off nowhere. She did all her crying into piles of the children's darning after the nine o'clock news, and she seldom looked lovely because she was too busy or tired to care, except in sporadic bursts, when she applied a handful of this or that with the cynicism of a witch doctor trying a little juju on a dead woman. I'm dead, I'm absolutely dead, had become one of her favourite expressions. War probably hadn't turned out the way she'd expected either, poor little devil. No doubt she'd seen it as a heroic landscape against which she would be gay and courageous, but it had contracted to a strip of floor between stove and sink. The gaiety and courage weren't needed to welcome home a returning warrior in a business suit who had somehow managed to survive the perils of the London rush hour. Maybe it was morbid of him to imagine that she would be happier in a one-bedroom flat somewhere, snatching sandwiches in cafes and mailing loving air letters to a husband who, thank God, the army was feeding thousands of miles away. When they built the house, it hadn't struck Mark that all its rooms were too big, that the hardware floors could look like the Sahara to a woman crawling over them with a tin of polish, and that its light paintwork showed up their nice bits of furniture and grubby childish finger marks with equal success. In those days, one didn't worry about things like that. Now, the house had become an old man of the sea whom, however much he throttled them, they couldn't unseat. If they sold it, they had nowhere to go and there were Bill and Sally to think of. It was so important for children, said Janet, frantically nailing more of her pathetic little tattered colours to the mast to have a secure background. Although Mark wasn't certain that getting out from under the feet of a harassed mother all day long was precisely the sort of beautiful, tranquil thing she had in mind. Motherhood was another of Janet's gay and courageous things, which, in the present hurly-burly, was taking a beating. Of course, he knew perfectly well that he was damn lucky. He and Janet had each other, their home, their children. There were plenty of people who would consider, quite legitimately, that he was having a pleasant and interesting war, for his job was an important one. Without even trying to, he was making hundreds of contacts, which would be very useful after it was over, and he was paddling his own canoe again. It was just that he hadn't pictured himself sitting out Armageddon in an office chair, helping to keep the home fires burning with his sleeves rolled up and one of Janet's aprons tied round the middle. It was funny, that was all. Going up to London one spring morning, Mark glanced down the Times casualty list and saw that a man called Nigel Travers, who had been at school with him, had been killed in action with a parachute corps in Italy. Good Lord, old Travers leaping out of planes in parachutes and he must have been 40 or thereabouts with a nice wife and some kids, Mark reflected. A quiet, funny sort of devil too. Not the sort of chap you'd have, you'd have suspected of going out that way. He put the paper down and began to worry about the hot water boiler, which hadn't looked too good when he stoked it up before bolting breakfast and dashing for the train. Janet, who had a cold, hadn't looked too good either. One or both of them, he felt, would have given up by the time he got home that night. He picked up the paper again, but the boiler kept on getting between him and the Russians, progress in Italy, poor old Travers plummeting down into some peasant's little bit of vineyard, instead of going on year after undistinguished year, getting in and out of bed with his jolly wife. <laughs> he wasn't surprised when, later in the morning, Janet rang up to say that she had a temperature and thought it must be flu. A neighbour had charitably come to the rescue and carted off the children for the day and she was now taking her shivering self to bed. The boiler, Mark was equally astonished to learn, had gone out. Leave it until I get home, he said, with all the cheerfulness he could muster. And for God's sake, take it easy, darling, and keep warm. He bought a paper on the way out to lunch. Life was a perpetual buying of papers, 
glancing, discarding, as though, it was, as though it were the only way of convincing oneself that the plans over which one slaved day after day, calculating, arguing around tables in close rooms, were somewhere being put into effect by real living flesh and blood. Another softening up raid on the French coast. Another statesman said that this would be the year of decision. A party of young Norwegians had escaped in a fishing boat. That's the right stuff, thought Mark. That's the right sort of war to be in if you've got to be in one at all. To be 21, sound of wind, of wind and limb, shoving off some dark jetty with your heart banging. Yes, that would be all right. But meanwhile, Janet had the flu. At his club, the dining room was full, mostly of middle-aged, self-confident looking men, leaning alertly forward in discreetly pitched conversations, as though settling the war out of hand between sherry and a cigar. Were any of them in jams at home, he wondered. It was hard to picture them in their shirt sleeves at the sink, but maybe it would be equally hard for them to picture him that way. An air vice marshal across the room nodded to him and he thought, has your wife got some help or do you have to get down on your knees in those beautiful trousers with that chest full of ribbons and light up the kitchen boiler for her? He started thinking about Travers again. He'd have to hunt up Mrs Travers's address and write to her, although there was nothing much to say. He didn't know why the thought of Travers, of all people, choosing to get himself killed in that particular way should make him feel faintly irritated, but it did. It seemed so unnecessary when there were hundreds of safer jobs which he could easily have plumped for. Well, that was hardly a line which would make Mrs Travers feel better. Back in the office, the incredible thing happened. Mark hadn't finished shaking the spring rain off his hat when his Miss Fletcher said that Arbuthnot would like to see him right away. When he went along, Arbuthnot told him that he was to be sent to Delhi in about 10 days time. By plane, of course, and probably on to Chungking, just like that, as briskly and prosaically as though he were being asked to pop across the road and mail a letter. All right for you, I suppose, said Abathnot, screening, squinting up at him. Mark thought of Janet briefly before he nodded and said, fine, and they settled down to details. When he finally got back to his own office, he still couldn't believe it. After over four years of sitting in one place with his nose to the grindstone, the idea of getting on a plane and going somewhere made him feel like a child let out of school. The whole job might take six months, he'd been told. The only unpleasant part ahead was telling Janet, but he'd get over that somehow. She would have to go down to his mother's, hard on the old lady who would have Janet, Bill and Sally added to the ever ravenous land girls, but it would be a bit of company for them all while he was away. Anyway, other men's wives were having to face, face infinitely worse separations every day and it was probably about time that Janet had her share. When he opened his front door that evening, his house greeted him with the chilly air of a home unswept, unwarmed, ungarnished. A jumble of garments and muddy gumboots in the hall indicated that the charitable neighbour had brought the children home and judging by sounds from above was now trying to get them to bed. Mark went up to the nursery and said, Mrs Stevens, you ought to have a medal struck for this. Don't you stay a minute longer, I'll finish them off. The charitable neighbour, looking relieved, said, Well, I have got Mr Stevens's supper to get, but I'll be over in the morning first thing to see how Mrs Goring is. And off she went. Mark took off his coat, set Bill to shoveling cereal and milk into his sister's mouth and went along to Janet. She looked flushed and harassed, lying huddled, huddled up in a little pink knitted jacket. I'll be up tomorrow, she said. The house must be looking awful. You'll stay right there, said Mark. Mrs Stevens and I are doing fine. We'll hardly miss you at all. I won't tell her about De Delhi tonight, he thought. I'll wait until she's feeling a bit better, poor thing. Mark, Bill ought to have some syrup of figs, Janet said. I'm sure Mrs Stevens hasn't given him any. All right, he said. I'll see to it. Mark shook up the pillows, collected some dirty things and went out. I don't suppose the hens have been shut up, she called hoarsely after him. Mark could almost feel affectionate towards the hens tonight. But what, he wondered, did one do with nine Rhode Island Reds when one unexpectedly went to India? Perhaps the invaluable Mrs Stevens could come to the rescue there too. Going back to the nursery, he transferred all the cereal that wasn't on the floor into Bill, Bill's mouth, sat Sally expertly on her pot and finally got them both pinned down in their cots.
Then he went downstairs and started to wash up the debris. What did you do in the Great War of Decision, Daddy? Stood at the sink, my boy, and got the sticky cereal unglued from your spoon. But only ten more nights and he'd be on his way. The hot water boiler stood looking at him like a cold, malevolent goblin, and he remembered that he must light it up. The kitchen looked a fearful mess too. It was some time before he had it straight and went up to Janet with a cup of Ovaltine and a fresh hot water bottle. Poor Mark, she said, I do hate to see you do this. Oh, don't worry, he said, I love it. He sat down on her bed with his arm round her shoulders while he drank the Ovaltine. By the way, he said, do you remember Nigel Travers? We met him and his wife, big fair girl, dancing at the Barclay one night, remember? Well, he's been killed with the parachute chaps. He couldn't stop the note of irritation from creeping into his voice. Last man in the world you'd, you'd have expected to join an outfit like that somehow. He was older than me, you know. Dancing at the Barclay, Janet said slowly. It seems an awfully long time ago. To his surprise, she suddenly began to cry. I suppose you wish it were you, she sobbed. You wish you'd gone off with Nigel Travers and jumped out of planes and got killed. Darling, don't be an idiot, said Mark. Yes, you do, you do, she said, crying bitterly. Eventually, he got her calmed down and went downstairs again to lay the breakfast table for the morning, put the milk bottles out and, as an afterthought, tried to find himself some cheese, tried to find himself a snack in the larder. He collected some bread and cheese and a bottle of beer and carried them into the living room. The nine o'clock news was just coming on. An order of the day from Marshal Stalin, said the calm BBC voice, and heavy fighting is in progress, and the Admiralty regrets to announce. Somewhere or other, thought Mark, munching his bread and cheese, it's all still going on. For men crouching in a muddy ditch, struggling in oily water, it had at least the bitter satisfaction of something seen in the round, not simply a column of figures locked in a government briefcase. Ten days from now, he thought, feeling suddenly lighter-hearted. As he stood at the sink later on, washing up the last, positively the last bloody plate of the day, he heard the bombers from the nearby flying field beginning to go over on the night's assignment. They droned slowly, purposefully, as regularly as buses passing down Piccadilly, over the house, the children sleeping in their cots, Janet feverishly dozing in the untidy bedroom, which must worry her so much, poor dear. Pretty soon, he went up to bed. Janet moved restlessly as he switched off the light and lay down. I'll wait for two or three days more, thought Mark, and then I'll have to tell her. As he lay staring in front of him, listening to the still, steady roar of the bombers, he pictured himself sitting in the plane, working at a bunch of papers on his knees, and suddenly a little speck appearing in the distance. The man sitting behind him leaned forward sharply. Messerschmitt, he said curtly, it could happen, thought Mark. It could happen perfectly well. And he lay smiling, listening to Janet cough, and hugging the thought that danger was as possible for him after all as it was for Nigel Travers or the next man. Isn't that totally brilliant and so weirdly relevant and also hilariously funny? Just gorgeous i love it um i feel like we all need to reread it again i mean not right now i'm sure you've got other things to do uh now we've all had 11s is but this is from the second persephone book of short stories and i feel like you need to get it and reread that story like every day for the next few of these weird few days and weeks um anyway thanks for joining today 11s is with fran hope you enjoyed it uh what should we read next week shall we read next week how are your 11s is going we'll see um have a brilliant weekend and I'll see you soon. Thanks.